Welcome back to the channel. So in this episode, we're actually going to jump back in the computer and we're going to install some really cool applications. So let's begin. Cool. Now, before we begin, there are many ways of installing applications in Linux. We have the software manager. There is the software application, and this, I believe, is the GNOME software installer. We have the GDB package installer. I'll just close these others. And this is the GDB package installer. We have the Synaptic package manager, and this is actually a favorite of many a Linux user. Then we have the terminal, and the simplest way to install an application in terminal is just to run the command sudo, and that's to run as a super user, followed by apt install, and then you just put in the application name that you want to install. Now, all of these applications can be found in the apps menu. So you just have to do a search, for example, gdb, there's the gdb package installer. But there are actually even more ways of installing applications. So if we jump into Firefox, we have app images, we have snap packs, and we have flat packs. Now the store where we can download flat packs, if you just scroll down, is flathub.org. Now FlatHub has an excellent collection of applications, and so does Snapcraft.io. Now Snaps are actually curated by the people at Canonical, and Canonical is the outfit behind Ubuntu. And then there's App Images. So the cool thing about App Images and Snap Packs and Flat Packs is that all of these applications come bundled with all of the dependencies that are required to run the latest version of these applications. Now this is really cool because Peppermint 10 is actually based on Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, which is not the latest version of Ubuntu, but by installing these three types of applications, we can actually install the latest version of many applications that we may want to install. So with that said, let's now install the very first application. So if I jump into my software manager, so that's in the apps menu, and it should actually be in your favorites. And let's just open software manager. And the very first application will be time shift. So if you just click time shift, and then install, And I'll throw in the old password. There we go. And I'll actually go into my apps menu and do a search for time shift. There it is there. And then just right click add to favorites. Now it's in my favorites. And let's launch it. Throw in the old password. And I'll minimize the software manager and follow the setup wizard. So just click next. Now in our location, the best bet is to actually store our time shift snapshots on an external hard drive. Now I actually don't have an external hard drive that is formatted to ext4 because that is the other prerequisite for your external hard drives. So for now, I'll just leave this set to store the snapshots on my actual computer hard drive, then click next. And I'll leave these automatic snapshots to occur daily. And basically what this means is that about 10 minutes after you first start up your system each day, it'll actually create a snapshot of your system, which is really excellent because this can actually save you headaches down the road and it'll actually keep the latest five snapshots of your system. So if you ever do run into issues, you can easily just revert back to one of your saved snapshots. So let's just click next and then finish. Cool, now if you jump into the settings, and then over to users. Now by default, TimeShift will take snapshots only of your system settings setup, and it won't actually store all your documents and your pictures and your music, etc., etc. But if you actually select these radio buttons and in include all, it'll actually include all of your hard drives. So if you were to do that, then the best bet is to store those snapshots on an external hard drive because those snapshots will actually be quite ginormous, especially if you have a very full hard drive. But we're just going to select users and exclude all, and that's the default. And so TimeShift will actually just take a snapshot of our system settings. Cool, so I'll just click close. For now, I'm not going to create a snapshot. I'll just close TimeShift and move to the next category of applications. So what we're going to install now are our password managers. Now there are a couple of really awesome free password managers that I can thoroughly recommend. The first one is called Bitwardens. If we jump online 
and then open a new tab and do a search for Bitwarden. There we go, and bitwarden.com. So let's just go straight to the download page. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll find the app image. And we actually set up our computer to install and move app images to one of our system folders. And that way, when we do take a time shift snapshot, then these applications will actually be saved as part of the snapshot. Now, if you wanted to know how to do that, just jump into part two of this Peppermint series. And at the very end of the video, I actually show you how to install an application called App Image Launcher, and it also will save your images to a system folder. So that said, let's now install Bitwarden. So just click on the link, and then let it open with App Image Launcher. Just click OK, and then click Integrate and Run. There we go, and I'll just move this to the side a little bit and minimize Firefox, and I'll just quickly log into my account. Cool, and I'll just quickly set this up. So control comma to open the settings. Cool, it's asking me to log in again, so I'll do that. Fantastic. And Bitwarden is actually really cool. You can save more than just passwords for websites. You can actually save notes for example, I have a few Manjaro commands that I have saved, and I also have my Brave Sync passphrase and a few other bits and bobs. So if you do actually have anything that you really want to save, then you can easily save it into Bitwarden. So I'll close out of Bitwarden for now and then jump online. And the great thing about Bitwarden is that it actually has a browser add-on. So if we just jump into our settings for Firefox and then go to add-ons and themes and then do a search for Bitwarden, And there it is there, I'll just click that, add to Firefox, then add, and OK. And it's opened it up in a sidebar, but I'll just close the sidebar, and then log into my Bitwarden account in my browser. Fantastic, and I'll just jump straight into the settings. Cool, so that's the Bitwarden add-on now added to my web browser. And now when I create accounts online, I can actually save my login details to Bitwarden rather than using the Firefox password manager. Cool, so that's Bitwarden installed. The second password manager is an application called KeyPassXC. So I'll do a search in my address line for KeyPassXC. And then go straight to the download page. Great, so if we just scroll down a little bit, here is the official app image. So I'll install that by clicking it. And then open it with App Image Launcher. And then click Integrate and Run. And unlike Bitwarden, this won't actually automatically open when I click the Integrate and Run button. So if I just minimize a Firefox and then jump into the Apps menu, and firstly, I'm going to add Bitwarden to my favorites. There it is there. Right click, add to favorites. And then I'll also add KeyPass XC. There it is there. So I'll right click, add to favorites. And KeyPass XC is an absolutely brilliant password manager. And if anyone would like me to create a tutorial on Bitwarden or KeyPass XC, then just let me know in the comments and I can easily put one of those together for you. Righty ho then. So the next set of applications that we're going to install will actually be our cloud drive. Now having a cloud drive synchronized to our computer is absolutely brilliant. It means that we can actually save files to an online cloud as well as our computer. And when we make changes to a file or a document that we have saved in our local synced folder, then it will actually update on the cloud as well. So the first sync agent that we're going to install will actually allow us to sync a local folder with our Google Drive. So if I jump into the software manager and then do a search for Google Drive. So let's click vDrive. And then install. 
So click continue to add the additional software. And I'll actually fast forward this install so that we can continue once it has completed. Right, so that's now installed. I thought I'd just have to mention that if you scroll down, you'll see that there are a few comments from people that have lost their documents. Now, there is actually a reason for this. If we jump online and then open a new tab and do a search for vDrive issues. And if we open this page here, and you'll see down here, it says don't sync when there's no internet. Now, basically what happens is that if you actually have vDrive set to automatically sync, and you just so happen to not be on the internet at the time, like you may be outside of your Wi-Fi range, or your internet for some reason is down, then basically vDrive will send a query to Google Drive and see that there are no files available. So what it'll actually do is delete the files on your local folder. Now we can circumvent that really easily. All we have to do is set up vDrive to run manually. So if we want to synchronize with our Google Drive, then we actually manually do the synchronization. So that said, let's now set up vDrive. So I'll minimize Firefox and the software manager. And the other thing to mention is that when you install a flat pack, it won't actually show up in your apps menu until you've done a reboot. So for example, if I go to my apps menu, and do a search for vDrive, you'll see that it doesn't actually show up. But that's okay because it will actually show up when we do a reboot. Cool, so let's set up vDrive. So if you go down to your panel and then just right click and then hover over panel and go up to panel preferences and then jump over to the items tab and then click the plus button to add a new item and then select launcher click add and then close and this has added the launcher to the end of the panel so let's select the launcher and then click the four horizontal lines to edit the selected item and then click the plus button to add an item to this launcher and then do a search for vDrive there it is there so I'll just select that click add then close and what I'll do is move it to the left of the system tray in between the system tray and the workspace switcher. So just use the up arrow and that'll move it across the panel. There we go. And now we can close panel preferences. Cool, so if you click on the vDrive, that will launch the vDrive synchronization application. And there we go, we have our notifications. So now if we double click vDrive, that will actually open up the preferences. So what I'll do is I'll tile this to the right of the screen. There we go. And then click on login and then give permission to vDrive and that will open a Firefox browser page. And now we can log in to our desired Google account. So I'll use Bitwarden to log in. And then click allow to give vDrive access to your Google account. And then copy the code and go over to your vDrive preferences and paste it into the field. Cool. Now to stop the automatic syncing from happening, just deselect this option here. And then I'm actually going to create a specific folder that I want this Google account to synchronize to. So I'll just click change folder and then go to my home directory and then create folder and then name it. And click create and then open. And now we have our specific vDrive folder created. Then click continue. And I'll just minimize Firefox for now. And then I'll maximize the vDrive preferences. 
and this button here that has a green border that's actually your start button so when I press it it'll actually turn red which turns it into the stop button so before I do that I'll actually enable advanced view and that gives us a text dialogue as to what is happening now click your start button and the synchronization will start there we go and when it says everything is up to date that means we have completed the sync so now we can click the stop button and it will tell us that the sync has stopped there we go syncing stopped by user request cool so that's now completed so if I open my file browser and then jump into the vGrive folder and now so if I make any changes to my local folder I'll just right click that and duplicate there we go and then jump into vGrive so now let's just assume that vGrive is closed and so this won't actually update the Google Drive until we've done a manual synchronization so let's double click the vGrive client and then click start and then everything is up to date so we can press stop now and so that in a nutshell is how to synchronize a Google Drive with a local folder on your computer so let's close out of vDrive and I'll actually delete this file here and then I'll actually go to my home folder and this vGrive folder here which was created automatically is not actually being used so I'll delete this folder as well and let's continue so having 15 gigabytes of Google Drive is absolutely awesome but wouldn't it be nice to have more than 15 gigabytes stored on the cloud so let's now install the next application that will allow us to do so so if you jump back online and I'll open a new tab and close the other tabs and then do a search in the address bar for Mega Drive there we go and it's either of these two here mega.nz or mega.io so I'll just click the mega.io And I'll just quickly do my cookie settings. Now Mega Drive beats Google Drive by 5 gigabytes. You actually get 20 gigabytes free. So let's install the Mega Drive client. So if you jump over to platforms and then click Mega Desktop App. And then scroll down a little bit. And then select the Linux distro. So we're using Ubuntu 18.04. So I'll just scroll down until I find that. There it is there click 18.04 and then select whether you're using a 64-bit or a 32-bit computer I'm using a 64-bit so I'll click download and then open it with the GW package installer and then throw in your password and there we go and then just click install package and I'll expand the terminal there we go and now that's downloaded so we can close out of the GW package installer now and I'll actually go back a page now if you don't have an account you can easily just click create account and then you can register your details etc but I actually have an account so I'll minimize Firefox for now and then jump into my apps menu and do a search for mega here it is there mega sync and I'll actually add that to my favorites and then launch mega sync there we go so now I'll log into my account there we go and I'll do a full sync and click next and now I'll actually create a specific local folder so I'll just click change and then jump into stempunk and then create new folder and then give it a name then click choose and then next and finish
So now if you look at the launcher down here in the system tray, it will actually begin to synchronize and you'll see by the fact that it has this little recycle black circle with two arrows on it. And that now indicates that the Mega Drive is synchronizing. So if we right click that and go up to show status, this will actually show the transfers taking place. So right now this is downloading my Mega Drive files down onto my computer. Now just take note here, it says that I have 40 gigabytes available to me. Now the reason why I have 20 extra gigabytes is because I was given bonuses for firstly downloading the application and also recommending Mega to a few people who actually signed up so that actually gave me some bonuses. But the thing to remember is that with the bonuses, they only last a set period of time. I think it's about a month and a half that you get these bonuses for. And then once the bonuses run out, it will revert back to 20 gigabytes. So if I actually saved more than 20 gigabytes to my cloud drive, then I'm at risk of actually losing some files because it will revert back to 20 gigabytes. So as long as you just remember to stay within your 20 gigabytes, then you should be perfectly fine. So I'll let that finish syncing and move on to the next set of applications. Now, if you have a mobile phone and you'd like to be able to send files from your phone to your computer and vice versa, then the next application will actually allow us to do so. So let's jump into Firefox, and then in the address line, do a search for KDE Connect. Here we go, and here it is here, kdeconnect.kde.org. Let's just go straight to the download page. And then under this heading Linux desktop, about the fourth word in is a link, it says available, so just click that. And then choose application, and then open link. And this will actually open the GNOME software application. So now that that's loaded, click install, throw in your password, and that will actually download to our computer. Awesome, that's now completed. So let's close the software app and I'll also minimize Firefox and then install the application on my phone. Now this works with Android and also Plasma phones. So right, so there are a couple of places we can install this from. We can either install it from the Play Store or using the F-Droid app. Now I've already downloaded F-Droid, I use that for a few of my applications. So if you click on F-Droid, and then do a search for KDE Connect. There it is there, so I'll select that, and then click Install. And next, install. Fantastic, that's completed. So I'll exit out of the F-Droid application and I'll jump into my apps menu and then click and drag that to my home page. Right, so let's now run KDE Connect on the mobile phone. So I'll click that and then jump into the settings, which are the three horizontal lines, and then settings, and I'll change the theme to dark theme. I'll also rename it. Cool, and then click the three horizontal lines again, and then pair new device. So while that is now waiting, let's open KDE Connect on the computer. So I'll open up the apps menu and do a search for KDE Connect and then click KDE Connect settings. And if I click refresh, then it won't actually see the phone. So we actually have to allow this through the firewall. So if we open up our apps menu again and then do a search for firewall configuration, there it is there, let's open that. Cool, and then let's go to rules, and then click the plus sign to add a rule. And then in the application filter field, do a search for KDE Connect, there it is there. And then all we have to do is click add, 
and then close. And now we have these rules that have been added to our firewall. So if I close out of the firewall now and then click refresh on the KDE Connect app, there we go, the phone has appeared. So I'll click the phone and then request pair. And then on my phone, click the available device, which is my computer, and then accept. And there we go, that was really easy. Now let's create a folder on our hard drive specifically for my phone files. So I'll scroll down this list here until I see share and receive and click the configuration cog. And then open the file dialog by clicking this button here. And I'll go to my home folder and then create a folder and then give it a name. Then click open. And now any file that we send will go directly to this folder here. So I'll click OK. And now if I jump into my file browser and open my phone folder, and then to send a file from my phone, I just click Send Files. And let's see, I'll just select an image. I'll send that one there. And there we go, it has been sent to my computer. And that is all there is to it. So it's an absolutely brilliant application. And now we can actually send photos directly from our phone to the computer. Fantastic, so I'll exit out of KDE Connect and I'll just click OK here. Cool, so the next application will actually allow us to send text messages from our computer to anyone in our address book on our phone. And this is using the Signal app, which enables us to send encrypted SMSs between yourself and anyone else that is running the Signal app. So basically you use Signal instead of your native SMS application on your phone. So firstly, you'll have to download and install it onto your phone. So to do that, you just jump into your Play Store and then do a search for Signal. And there it is, Signal Private Messenger. So I'll just click that. And I've actually already installed it on my phone. So here you would just actually click install, but I'm updating mine while I'm at it. Cool, so that's now installed or updated. And then click OK to allow Signal to manage your messages. So just click OK, and there we go. Cool, so let's now exit out of the Play Store and then go back to my home page. And now that we have it installed on the phone, let's now jump online and install the application for our computer. So in the search line, just do a search for Signal app. And there we go, signal.org forward slash download, just click that. And then over here where it says download for Linux, click that. And these are the commands that we'll have to put into our terminal window. So I'll tile my Firefox window to the left and then open a terminal window. So Control Alt T and I'll tile this to the right. Now, if we triple click the line, we actually only get the first part of the first command. So what we have to do is actually double click and then just drag your mouse downwards and then pass the line and that will actually select the complete command. So now that we've got it selected, right click copy, and then in terminal, if you hold down Control Shift and V, that will paste it, and then enter your password. Cool, let's go to the second command. So just double click the first word, and then drag your mouse downwards past the line, and that will select the entire command. Then right click copy, back in terminal, Control shift v and then let's get the last command so we can actually triple click this line right click copy and then Control shift v to paste click enter and that is completed right so let's close the terminal window and minimize firefox 
and I'll close this file browser window. And so for the next step, because of the security that Signal actually has, I won't actually be able to record the screen. So what I'm gonna do is move the camera and position it over my phone to show you the steps as I do them on my phone. Right, so here we are on the phone. So I'll open my Signal application. And then in the top right corner, click the three dots and then select settings. And now if we click linked devices, then the plus sign. And now let's jump on to our computer and then open up the apps menu and then do a search for signal. There it is there and I'll add that to my favorites. And then launch the signal app. And now if I take my phone and then scan the QR code. Cool, and now if I click the blue link device at the bottom. The phone is now linked to my computer. So now on the computer, I'll just click finish linking phone. And now Signal on my computer is linked with my Signal app on my Android phone. So now if I jump into my settings by clicking control comma, and I'll choose dark theme, and then exit out of preferences. And now if I go back to my messages, and I'll send a message to myself from my computer. So I'll type in my number, and I'm actually already a contact, so I'll just click and then send myself a message. And there we go, the message has been sent. So I've now received it on my phone. Now this is great, you'll actually be able to send text messages to anyone in your phone address book from your computer, including yourself. So that is Signal now configured on our computer. Cool, so I'll close out of Signal, both on my computer and on my phone. And let's move on to the next set of applications. So what I'm gonna install now is a couple of web browsers. Now you may recall in the last video, if we open up the Peppermint Settings panel and go to Tweaks, the browser manager is unable to install Vivaldi and the Brave web browsers. So what I'm gonna do now is actually install both Vivaldi and Brave. So let's exit out of the web browser manager and I'll close the Peppermint Settings panel, jump into Firefox, and then in the search tab, do a search for Brave Browser. There it is there. And brave.com, let's just go straight to the download page. And then download Brave for Linux. And then let's click the release channel, that's the stable version. And these are the commands that we're going to put into our terminal window. So let's open terminal, control alt T, and I'll tile terminal to the right. And then let's get the first line. So I'll just triple click this whole line, copy and then paste into terminal, into your password. Cool, and then let's grab the next line. So I'll triple click to get the whole line. Right click, copy, and then Control Shift V to paste. Press Enter. Let's get the third line. And then the fourth. Cool, and now the final command. So I'll just triple click, right click copy, and then right click paste. Press Y for yes.
And there we go, we've now installed Brave. So let's add that to our favorites. Just jump into your apps menu, do a search for Brave, there it is there. And I'll just right click that and add to favorites. Cool, and now let's install the Vivaldi web browser. So I'll just do a search for Vivaldi browser. There it is there. And there it is there, vivaldi.com. Let's go straight to the download page. Then scroll down and click the green Vivaldi 4.0 for Linux Deb. Open it with the GDB package installer. And so this should actually be downloading now. Cool, and then enter your password for the GDB package installer. And I'll close my terminal window because we're done with that. And I'll minimize the Firefox window. And then click Install Package. And I'll open up the terminal for this. And there we go, the installation is complete. So we can close the GDB package installer. And let's now add the Vivaldi web browser also to the favorites. So there it is there. Just right click, add to favorites. Cool, so we've got now three awesome web browsers. We've got Brave web browser, Vivaldi, and also Firefox. So I use all three of these web browsers and I actually have profiles in all three of them. And that way I can actually save my settings, etc and use them on various computers. Cool, so let's move on to the next set of applications. Right, so the next set of applications we're going to install will allow us to manage our emails. And I'm actually going to install two email managers, and one of them I'll use for my business emails, and the other I'll use for everything else. So let's jump into the apps menu and open the software manager. Here we go, and I'll just move this to the left a little bit and then do a search for evolution. Cool, and there's evolution at the top, so let's click that, and then install. Then click continue to allow the additional software. Throw in your password. Fantastic, that has installed, so I'll add that to my favorites. So just right click, add to favorites. And let's jump online to add the second email manager. And I'll minimize the software manager. And then in the address bar, type in the address getmailspring.com. There we go, so just click on the download MailSpring free. And although there's no 32-bit version, there are 64-bit versions. So this time I'll actually install the Snap version, and then just click on Install. And for this I'll actually use the command line to install it. So let's open up a terminal window, Control-Alt-T, and I'll just tile that to the right. Triple click to get the line, and then right click Copy, and then in Terminal, right click paste, add in your password, and this is the stable version. Now the great thing about using both Evolution and MailSpring as our email clients is that they both allow us to use HTML signatures so we can look really profesh, and there are also all sorts of other features that are available to us. Fantastic, now that has installed. Now, although I've actually installed MailSpring, it won't actually appear in my apps menu until I do a reboot. But what I'll mention now is that MailSpring is absolutely awesome for business applications. Now, you can actually use Gmail and Office 365 and any other IMAP email type. 
in Mailspring. So it's really, really good for business. And Evolution is also very powerful as well. And you could probably use both of them for business. Now, if you had a 32-bit system, then probably the best bet is to jump into your software manager and then install Thunderbird. And here's Thunderbird here. Now, I used to use Thunderbird a lot on my Linux system, but what I found is that both Mailspring and Evolution are absolutely awesome. Cool, so that's our email clients installed. Let's now move on to the next category. So the next set of applications we'll install will actually be our Office Suites. So if you normally use the Microsoft Office Suite, then these next couple of applications will actually be a very powerful and awesome replacement for that. So I'll minimize Firefox and I'll exit out of terminal. And then in the software manager, do a search for LibreOffice. And there we go. So I'll actually install the meta package and that installs all of the LibreOffice suite. So let's click that and then install. Click continue to allow the additional software. Throw in your password. And I'll also fast forward just a little bit. Cool, so that's installed. Let's minimize the software manager and jump into the apps menu. And I'll add this to my favorites as well. So there it is. Right click and add to favorites. Now let's just jump back into the apps menu and I'll go back to the office category and then open up LibreOffice Draw. Now if you're used to using Adobe Acrobat to edit your PDFs, then check this out. This is absolutely amazing. So we'll just open up a PDF file. Cool, and if I jump into the first page, now you'll notice that the text kind of goes right off the page and it's not really aligned. And this is basically because we're not using the right fonts. So if I click on one of the lines, you'll see that Eowyn Old Style is the font that's being used. So if I copy that and then jump online and then I'll download this font. There we go and I'll go to freefonts.com And I'll just save and exit. And here it is here. So also just hover over it and then click the download button. And that will take us to an external website. There we go. And I'll just scroll down here and then click this. And save file. And I'll just save it to my downloads. So that's downloaded. Let's open that. And right click extract here. Now if I open that up and then to install it we just have to copy it to a folder. So if I go back to my file browser window and then open a new file browser window and I'll tile this one to the left and then go to file system user share and then let's look for the fonts folder and there it is there so I'll right click that and then open as root fantastic and I'll close this window and I'll drag this to the left and then open up true type and then just drag this file into the true type window there it is there so now if we go back to LibreOffice draw and I'll close this and reopen it and we can close these file browse windows now and I'll minimize Firefox. Go back to the apps menu and then in the office category open up LibreOffice Drawer. And I'll reopen that file again. And if we go to the table of contents, you'll notice that this font actually is going off the page. So I'll show you how to quickly fix that. So if you select this whole line by triple clicking, here we go. And then we can just reduce the size to say 36. And now it fits. And we can even just move this across. 
across a little bit. And that's a very quick fix. So there we go. So if you have a simple PDF that you want to rebuild or edit, then this is pretty much how you'd go about doing it. Cool, so that's PDFs. Let's close there. And I won't save that. Cool, now LibreOffice is awesome, but there's actually another program which I've found is actually a lot closer to Microsoft Office. And that's a program called OnlyOffice. So if we jump into our browser and then do a search for OnlyOffice, and onlyoffice.com, that is the website. So let's go straight to the free desktop apps. And then scroll down until we find the deb package. And because we're using Ubuntu 18.04, this will actually be compatible. So just click download deb. And then open with the GDB package installer. So that's downloading now. Fantastic, now throw in your password. Cool, and all the dependencies are satisfied. So click install package, and we can expand the terminal here. And fantastic, that has completed. So let's close the GDB package installer, and I'll minimize only Office and I'll actually close the software manager and then add only office to my favorites. There it is there, add to favorites. Now, if you open up only office, you'll see that you can actually use it with a cloud server. Now, if you have a cloud server installed at your business, then this will actually allow you to be able to collaborate with other people in your office on the same documents or you can actually create an only office cloud so i'll just click that and this is actually free for five users so this is really good or you can actually get a free office so if we go back to the start tab and i'll just open these so presentation is the only office version of powerpoint and of course, book is the only office version of Excel. And of course, document is the only office version of Word. And as you can see, the layouts are very, very familiar. So if you normally use Word or Excel or PowerPoint, then you'll find only office really, really awesome. Now, the other thing to remember is that because we're using a Linux system, we actually don't have the core Microsoft fonts installed. So let's go and install them now. So I'll close only office and then open the Synaptic Package Manager. So I'll throw in the old password. Fantastic, and then in the search field, just do a search for Microsoft Fonts. There we go, and this is the package here that we want to install. So just click that, right click, mark for installation. And then also mark the additional required changes. Then click apply and apply. And I'll expand that for the downloads. And then the changes being applied. And there we go, we've now installed the core Microsoft fonts. So now that will actually increase the possibility of being able to open up most Word documents pretty accurately on our Linux system. Brilliant, so let's close the Synaptic Package Manager. There's actually another really powerful piece of software if I jump into my Synaptic Package Manager. Now this will actually allow us to do some desktop publishing. Now granted, you can still build things in GIMP or in Libre Draw or anything like that, but this next piece of software is absolutely brilliant for building things like posters and brochures and business cards and even eBooks. So this piece of software is called Scribus. So let's do a search for that now. There it is there. So I'll select that and then control click to select the template as well and then right click mark for installation and then click mark again and that's also selected scribus data 
then click apply and apply and I'll expand the downloads and also the changes. And there we go, we've now installed Scriber. So I'll close the Synaptic Package Manager and jump into the Apps menu and I'll add that to my favorites as well. There it is there, add to favorites. And if we just have a quick look at Scribus. And there we go, so if you go new from template, here are all the templates that are available to us. So there's everything from advertisements to announcements to brochures, business cards, calendars, newsletters, PDF presentations, text documents. It's actually really awesome. And if you search online, you can actually find other Scribus templates that have been made up by other people. Cool, so that's a quick look at Scribus. I'll cancel out of there and I'll close Scribus. Right, so the very last application that I'll install in this little category of Office applications is a piece of software called Trello. Now, if you've ever used Trello, it's absolutely awesome for planning things. And so for this install, we'll jump into the apps menu. Let's install an ICE SSB. So I'll click that. Now what SSB stands for is Site Specific Browser. So basically if you have an online web app that you use, you can actually get it to behave like an application on our computer. So for example, if I jump into my apps menu and then go to the office category, you'll see that all of these Microsoft products are all online SSBs, as is this Google Drive application. It actually opens a web browser window to allow us to manage a Google Drive there. And that's the same with this Google Calendar. As you can see, if I hover over it, it says ICE SSB and same with this Gmail application. Also, if you jump into the games category, all of these are actually ICE SSB. So they're not actually installed on your computer, which is really, really cool. It means that you actually save a bit of hardware space. And the other really cool thing about SSBs is that you actually get to use online applications that are usually the latest version of those applications. Now to get a list of all the SSBs that are installed, just go over to your ICE SSB manager and then go over to the remove tab. And if I just expand that a little bit, all of these applications are actually SSBs. So if you want to remove any of them, all you have to do is just click it and then one by one, click remove. So I'll remove all the games. So now that I've deleted all the games, if I go over to my apps menu, you'll see that the games category has actually disappeared. So until I actually install another game, then that category won't exist. Cool, so let's go back to the ICE manager and I'll go to create and creating an SSB is actually super simple. So I'll just move that to the right a little bit and then jump back online and I'll open a new tab and I'll close the other tabs. And let's create an SSB. So if you wanted your SSB to open on a precise page, so for example, if I go to Trello, and I'll go to the login page, and I'll just log in to my Bitwarden. And then log in. There we go. And I actually want the SSB to open on this page here. So as you can see, I have my boards as my project manager for this channel. So I'll just move the ICE manager to the right a bit. So right, so I'll first give this SSB a name. So I'll just call it And then I actually want this to open on this specific page here. So I'll just copy and paste the URL and then enter it into this field here. And then we're in the menu. So this refers to whereabouts in the menu here. And I actually want it to be placed into this office category. So I'll change this to office. 
And then rather than use the site Fabicon, which is this Trello Fabicon up here, I actually want to use my own icon. So I'll go over to my avatar here and I'll just right click it, open image in new tab. And there it is there. Right click it, save image as. And at the end of the last video, I actually created a folder for this icon. So I'll go over to other locations and then computer and then user share and I'll scroll down to icons there it is there and then I'll go to the folder that I created there it is there and I'll open that and then I'll name this avatar icon cool and then click save and so now that's downloaded I can close that tab and then go over here to select an icon and then go back one folder scroll up to icons and then select my icons folder and then double click that and there it is loaded here so I'll click apply and that's cleared all the fields if I go over to my apps menu and then go into my office category here is the SSB that I just created so I'll right click that and add it to favorites and then let's open that and do a quick edit of the SSB cool so it wants me to log in so I'll just jump over and grab my password and then log in here I'll click never save here Ooh. fantastic and I'll actually tile this to the right and I'll scroll across cool so as you can see with the SSB we don't actually have the URL line or tabs or anything anything like that but it is a good idea to do a very quick edit so if you click your alt key on your keyboard this will bring up the file menu at the top and then just go to edit and then settings and so that's essentially opened a new tab but we just don't see the tab field at the top so firstly I'll restore previous setting I'll also get it to warn before quitting and then jump over to the security tab and I'll just scroll down here and I'll deselect the Firefox data collection scroll back up and I'll actually give this a primary password so let's see of course we've now given it a password and I'll just jump over to the themes and I'll enable the dark theme so to close this tab you just use the shortcut Control W and then we'll close that window too. Control W and then this one too. Control W and this one here, Control W. Cool, so we've now installed and configured our first SSB. So I'll exit out of there now, and I'll close the ICE Manager. Right, so the next application we'll install will be brilliant for anyone giving lectures or presentations or anything like that. This is actually an awesome digital whiteboard. So let's open a new tab, and then do a search for App Image Hub. There we go, and it's this link here, appimagehub.com. And then in the search bar right at the top, just do a search for open board. There it is there, so I'll click that. I'll actually maximize this window. And so what we're going to install now is the most up-to-date version of OpenBoard. If you actually do a search for OpenBoard, and it's this website here, openboard.ch. So if you click this, 
So if we try to install it from the official website, we'll actually get a slightly older version of OpenBoard. But because we're installing the app image, we'll actually get pretty much the latest version. So let's download it now. Click the download button and then select the app image. And then click download. And we'll get it to open with the app image launcher. And so that's now downloading. So I'll fast forward this bit and then rejoin you once the download has completed. Fantastic, that's completed the download. Let's click integrate and run. And this is our whiteboard. So if you actually had a tablet, you could easily use the tablet to draw. So for example, if you wanted to do a quick chart, just hold down your control button and that will keep it straight. So that's a quick demo on how to use open boards. So now you'll be able to give awesome lectures with the ability to use a whiteboard. Brilliant, so let's quit out of there. And I'll minimize a Firefox and move on to the next category. Cool, so the next set of applications will be our note-taking applications. Now, the first application that I'll install will be a note-taking application that can be used on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and even iPhones and Androids. So the first application is an application called Joplin. Now, this is my favorite note-taking application. So let's jump into Firefox and then do a search for Joplin. And there we go, joplinapp.org. So I'll just go to the website. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that we have the installers for Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. So it's very platform cross compatible. And so with this app, I'm able to actually take notes on my phone and then open them up on my computer and vice versa. So let's get the Linux version. So I'll just click that. And then I'll get it to open with App Image Launcher. And so that's downloading. Here we go. And I'll click integrate and run. And I'll minimize Firefox. And here we have the Joplin application. So I already have Joplin installed on my phone. And basically how this works is if I go over to tools and then options or control comma and then go over to synchronization. You can actually synchronize this using these various applications. And if you don't have any of these, you can just use the Joplin Cloud, which is a free service. But I actually have this hooked up to my Dropbox. So if I use the back button, and I'll actually delete this note here. And if I go to tools or control comma, and then I'm just gonna change it to a dark theme. Cool. And then if I click synchronize, and what I'll do is I'll tile this to the right. There we go. And if I click this link here, it will allow me to log into my Dropbox using my web browser. So I'll use Bitwarden to log into my Dropbox account. I just won't save that. Then click allow and then grab that and copy it and then back in Dropbox in this field here just click paste and submit and it's now been authorized. So if I click OK and then synchronize it will actually synchronize with my Dropbox. So I'll minimize my Firefox browser and I'll move this over to the left. And I'll just allow this now to synchronize with my Dropbox and then I will give you a really quick look at how this works. Right, so that's now synchronized and as you can see all of my notebooks are encrypted. So I'll just click on set the password and I'll drag that open a little bit. And then I'll enter all my passwords for my various devices. So this is how many devices I actually use Joplin on. 
So just log in. There we go. And I'll also go over to my web clipper and I'll enable web clipper service. And this way I can actually save websites to my Droplin application. So I'll go over here to install the extension and then just click add to Firefox and add then OK. And if I click on the extension, it will say that it's not available on this tab due to missing host permission for the tab. So basically I have to close and reopen Firefox. So I'll do that now. And there we go. Right, so here we are in the Droplin. If I jump into any of my notes, you'll see that this was from the last video. And as I work through each item, I just cross it off. And I'm currently up to note taking and I've just installed a Droplin. So the very last configuration I'll do in Droplin is I'll go back into the settings, control comma, and then go to application and then show tray icon and then apply. Now we have the icon down here in the system tray. So that way I always know when Joplin is open. Cool, I'll go back and I'll actually close this because I have it open on a different computer so I can still follow along my process. So as you possibly saw when I had Joplin open is that the next application that we're gonna install is one called Standard Notes. So Standard Notes. Here we go, so standardnotes.com, if we just open that. And so Standard Notes is another very powerful note-taking application. And I've only just started using Standard Notes because I do love Joplin so much, but let's install this as well. Download for Linux, and it should start automatically. We'll get it to open with the App Image Launcher. There we go, and then Integrate and Run. And here we are in standard notes. So from here, you can actually register an account. You can add a passcode and you can download backups of your notes or import backups even. So if we just close out of there. Now I thought I'd just mention with standard notes, if you go back to the website, I'll just scroll down a little bit. You can actually extend standard notes and there are a bunch of extras that you can add to standard notes. And there is a pretty low monthly price for this, but that said, I've tried out the free version and it seems to be pretty powerful in itself. So that's our note taking apps taken care of. So I'll close standard notes and I'll minimize Firefox and I'll go back into Joplin and I can now tick off note taking. Cool, so I'll actually close Joplin on this computer because I have it running on a different computer. Which brings us to our next set of applications, which are our graphic design applications. So the first application we'll install is one that was native to Linux, but now you can actually get Windows and Mac versions as well. And that is an application called GNU Image Manipulation Program, otherwise known as GIMP. Now, whoever came up with that name probably didn't realize just how big this program would become. So let's jump online. And let's download the flat pack. So if we jump over to flathub.org. And then do a search for GIMP. There we go. Now the reason why we're actually installing the flat pack version of GIMP is because we're actually gonna extend this to emulate Photoshop. So let's click the link. Now we can either install it by clicking this button here or if we scroll down the page, here are the install commands. So let's open up a terminal window, control alt T and I'll tile that to the right and then copy that line and then in terminal paste. Y for yes and then Y for yes. So I'll fast forward this and then rejoin you once it has finished installing.
Cool, so that's finished installing. I'll minimize Terminal and Firefox. And let's jump into the Apps menu and do a search for GIMP. There it is there. So I'll add that to Favorites to start. And then open it. And there we go. So this is the GIMP interface. If I just double click that to maximize the window. Now GIMP does pretty much everything that Photoshop does. The only thing about it is that if you did come from a Photoshop background, then the shortcuts that you normally use, the layout and the methodology are slightly different. So you'd probably have to relearn a few things, but that said, it's definitely worth relearning. However, there's actually an add-on that we can add to GIMP that will actually make it very, very similar to Photoshop, including the shortcuts and the layout, etc. So let's install that now. So we'll close GIMP and jump back online. And then in the address line, do a search for Photo GIMP. Here we go, so Dio Linux or Dio Linux, I'm not sure how you say that. Click that link to their GitHub. And then if we scroll down, one of the awesome things about PhotoGimp is that it actually includes 1,800 fonts. So already just by installing PhotoGimp, you've saved a heap of time because you don't have to download all of these fonts. Cool, so let's keep scrolling down. And then under the installing PhotoGimp heading just go to the releases page link and just click that and then download this zip file so i'll just save it to my downloads folder there we go that's downloaded so i'll open that now and i'll minimize firefox and the first thing i'll do is extract the folder so i'll just right click extract here there it is there so i'll just double click that to enter the folder and you may think well there's nothing here except for a text file but actually if you right click and click show hidden files and this is actually all written in this how to install photogimps patch text file and you'll see that we have three folders so all you have to do is just select all of the folders and then drag them into your home directory. So this is now asking us if we'd like to merge these folders. So I'll firstly click apply this action to all files and then click merge. And then I'll move this back to the left again and do the same again. So apply this action to all files and then click replace. There we go. Right, so now I'll go to the home directory and then right click and I'll deselect show hidden files. Cool, so that's it, we've now installed PhotoGimp. So let's close the file browser window and I'll go back to the apps menu. And now if we reopen GIMP, the first thing we'll see is that there is a new splash screen. And here we are in GIMP or actually PhotoGimp. And if I double click the title bar just to maximize the window or actually fit it into my screen space, and this is actually a very similar layout to Photoshop. And also many of the keyboard shortcuts are the same. So a big shout out to the crew at Dio Linux. If I go back one page, it's this crew here, the contributors. This is a really awesome extension or add-on that has just made GIMP very, very accessible to many more people, especially people who come from an Adobe background. Cool, so I'll minimize Firefox and I'll close GIMP. Now, if you were following along the last video, you may recall in the graphics category, we have Pixlr already installed. Now these are actually SSBs, so they're essentially online apps that behave as an application on our computer. And if we just scroll down here, we have two photo editors that we can choose from. One is the Pixlr editor, and that is the more powerful version of Pixlr. But we also have Pixlr Express, and Pixlr Express I actually use quite a bit because it is so simple and also very, very quick to use. So if we, for example, open up the desktop image that we were editing before, and I'll just click Arrange and Style. And we can do some awesome edits so simply. So for example, let's try the liquify function and I'll get it to shrink. 
and I'll turn on the high quality preview. And there we go, just made a bit of abstract art pretty easily. So that's Pixlr already pre-installed. So I'll just close out of there and I'll close Pixlr. Now there's actually another awesome application that I have just started using as well, which is very, very powerful. It actually allows us to be able to animate our images. So let's jump back online and this time do a search for an application called Krita. So that's K-R-I-T-A. And here it is here. So Krita Digital Painting, just click that. And as you can see, this is also cross-platform compatible. So if you do decide to learn Krita, you can actually use it on various platforms as well. So let's click Get Krita Now. And I'm going to install the app image, and that way we get the latest version. So I'll click that. And then open with App Image Launcher. And that's now downloading. So I'll just fast forward this a little bit and then rejoin you once the download has finished. There we go. So I'll just minimize Firefox and then click Integrate and Run. And here we go in Krita. So as I said, it is an awesome application. Much of its functionality is actually not too dissimilar to Photoshop. We still have our toolbar to the left and we have our brushes, layers, etc., to the right. So yeah, this is an awesome Photoshop alternative and in its own right, a brilliant graphic design application. Cool, so I'll close out of Krita. Now, if you were from a Photoshop background, there is actually an amazing online application, which is an almost feature for feature copy of Photoshop. It's absolutely brilliant. I've only just discovered this recently. So if you jump back online and then do a search for Photopia. And this is it here, photopia.com. And so this is absolutely awesome. You can open Photoshop files, Adobe Illustrator files, PDFs, GIMP files. Very, very cool. So if you are used to using Photoshop and you just wanted to do some quick editing, Photopia is pretty much the same as using Photoshop. There's only a few things missing, but most things are the same. So Photopia, absolutely brilliant. Cool, so I'll minimize Firefox for now, and we're done with our graphic design applications. Let's move on to the next category, which is pretty exciting. Cool, so the next set of applications we'll be installing will be our multimedia applications. So the very first application to install will be VLC. Now let's install that using our software manager. And here it is on the home page. So I'll just click VLC and then install. Then click continue to add the additional software. Throw in your old password. And VLC is absolutely awesome because it actually allows us to open pretty much every single type of file there is from audio files to video files. So it's a very powerful multimedia player and streamer. So that's now installed. Now I'll minimize the software manager. Now firstly I'll add it to my favorites and it'll be in the multimedia section. So I'll just right click that, add to favorites. And if I go back to the multimedia section, you'll notice that there's already a media player installed. So if I right click that and then click on edit application, it shows us that it is the X player. So to keep things tidy, I'm actually gonna uninstall X player because we now have VLC to use instead. So I'll just cancel out of there and then open up the Synaptic Package Manager.
cool. And then I'll just do a search for X player. And what I'm going to do is actually select all of these that are ticked. So just hold down your control key and then you can select multiple items. And then just right click any of them and mark for complete removal. Then apply and apply again. And I'll expand the details. And that way there are no conflicts so VLC can actually handle all of our media requirements. Cool, that's completed. Let's close the Synaptic Package Manager. Now, although VLC is an incredibly powerful application and it can pretty much open any media file that you throw at it, it's not really designed as a good music player. So what we're going to install now is a brilliant music and audio player and it is called Sayonara. So if we open up our Firefox window, so in our address bar do a search for Sayonara music player. Here it is there. And here it is here, Sayonara player. So if I open that, And then go to Downloads. And then click on the Debian Ubuntu Mint link. And here are the commands to install Sayonara. So I'll tile Firefox to the left. And then Control Alt T to open up a terminal window and I'll tile that to the right. And then triple click to get the first line. Right click copy and then paste into terminal. Throw in the old password and then enter again. Cool, let's get the next line. So I'll just triple click the line, right click copy, right click paste. And then the last command And there we go, that's installed. So I'll add Sayonara to my favorites. There it is there. Right click, add to favorites. And so now we have a music player and a media player. Now you can still use VLC to open up your audio files, but I've just found that using Sayonara player is brilliant for managing your music library. Cool, so that's our media and music players installed. The next application will actually allow us to take awesome screenshots. Now, if you jump into your apps menu and just do a search for screen shot, you'll notice there are actually already a couple of screenshot applications installed. So if I click on screenshot, for example, and so for example, if I selected a region and then clicked OK, and then for example, if I wanted to take a screenshot of that, then these are all the actions that can be taken with the screenshot. So we can only save it, copy it to the clipboard, or open it with one of our applications, or we can host it on Imgur. But we can't actually do anything if the screenshot wasn't perfect and we wanted to slightly change the dimensions, then we can't actually do it with this application. However, with Flameshot, which is what we're about to install, we can do all of that and more. So the first thing I'll do is just cancel out of there, and I'll exit out of Terminal and minimize Firefox, open up the software manager, and then do a search for Flameshot. Cool, and I'll click on the first one, and then install. Throw in the old password. And there we go, that's installed. So I'll minimize the software manager, and I'll add Flameshot to my favorites. So I'll right click, take graphical screenshot, add to favorites. And what I'll also do is create a shortcut so I can just take a screenshot using a keyboard shortcut. So I'll right click that, click edit application, and then move this launcher dialog to the left. And next I'll open up the pavement settings panel. So I'll right click the desktop, 
and launch the pavement settings panel then click on keyboard settings application shortcuts and I'll add the shortcut here so click add and I'll copy and paste flameshot GUI click OK and for the shortcut I'll choose alt full stop so let's test that alt full stop and there we go that's worked so I'll take a screenshot and the brilliant thing about this screenshot application is that I can actually edit the screenshot after I've taken it so let's just move that over to there and then resize it to there and that way we can be a lot more precise and as you can see there are also all of these options around the side so the cool thing about this is I can actually edit the screenshot directly so for example if I wanted to highlight a region or if I wanted to add a note Then if I save the screenshot, it'll actually include those notes in the screenshot. So it's a very powerful application and it actually has a lot more options than the pre-installed screenshot application. So I won't save that and I'll actually close that and cancel out of there and close pavement settings panel. And just to keep things tidy, I'll uninstall the other screenshot applications. So what I'll do is actually close the software manager and also the terminal and then do a search for screenshot so i'll just right click this to find out what it's called edit application this is the xfce4 screen shooter and then if i go back to the apps menu and search again screenshot scrot helper and i'll go to the end of the command and this is the pavement scrot helper cool so i know what they're called now if i go back to the apps menu and open up the synaptic package manager and i'll tile this to the left and do a search for screenshot and there we have the pavement scrot helper so i'll click that and then i'll control click the xfce4 screen shooter right click mark for complete removal and then apply apply again and there we go that's completed so if i do another search in the apps menu we can see that they have now been uninstalled cool now we can take screenshots i'll close the synaptic package manager and the next application will actually allow us to record the screen so if for example you wanted to record a video that was being played online or you just wanted to record yourself doing some actions on your screen then the next application is absolutely brilliant for doing that i'm actually using it already if i just open up my fourth workspace simple screen recorder is what we're about to install and right now i'm recording this whole session and the cool thing about simple screen recorder is that it actually has a really low resource use so I found that if I used OBS which is also a brilliant piece of software I can run into issues with my computer using too many of its system resources to run OBS whereas Simple Screen Recorder just seems to be able to record anything and I can do most things without any issues or running out of RAM or anything like that so for example if I just open up my terminal window and then run NeoFetch I'm actually only using 1700 megabytes of RAM. If I was using OBS, I'd definitely be using more RAM. So Simple Screen Recorder is not only simple, but it actually has a really low footprint. And it's quite configurable as well. So I'll close out of there and I'll go back to Workspace One and then jump online and do a search for Simple Screen Recorder. Cool, so Martin Bart. I'm not sure if I'm saying that name right, but thank you for creating this. It's a brilliant piece of software. And then if you click on download, and so to install this, you just have to follow these instructions for Debian. So copy the first line by triple clicking it, 
copy it, open up a terminal window and paste. And then triple click the second line and right click copy and then paste. And of course it says that I've already got the newest versions. So that's pretty much how to install it. If you were actually running a 32-bit system, then after that command, you would copy and paste this command into your terminal window. So that's our screen recorder installed. So now we can capture stills using Flameshot. We can capture video using Simple Screen Recorder. Let's now install an awesome application that will allow us to record audio. So this is brilliant for recording things like lectures or meetings or even just recording yourself. So I'm actually using this next piece of software to record the audio for this video. And of course the application is called Audacity. So I'll close out of terminal and I'll minimize Firefox and then jump into the apps menu and open up the software manager and do a search for Audacity. Cool, so I'll install the first one. And I'll just click continue and add my password. And I'll fast forward this bit and rejoin you once the install has completed. Brilliant, so that's installed. I'll minimize the software manager and add Audacity to my favorites. There we go, and I'll give you a quick demo on how powerful Audacity is. So if I just click on Audacity, and I'll OK that, and I'll just move this to the left a little bit. So up here we see the microphone, if you just click here to check the monitoring, and there we go. So the microphone on my computer is working. So what I'll do is on my keyboard I'll press P for pause and then R for record, and so now we're armed and ready to record. And I'll just record a little sentence and I'll show you how we can improve that recording. So if I press P again, that'll start recording. This is a little section to see how we can get rid of background noise. And there we go. So if I just click stop now. Right, so the first thing I'll do is I'll make a copy of the recording. So I'll just double click to select all and then go up to edit and then duplicate there we go and on my keyboard i'll click Control shift f and that'll fit everything into the window now i'll mute this track because this is our original and then in this track here i'll select some of the background noise and i'm only selecting the background noise and not my talking then go up to effect noise reduction and then click get noise profile and so that's now getting a profile of what the background noise frequencies are. Then let's select the entire track, so double click, and then go up to effect, and noise reduction, and I'll leave the presets as is, and click OK. So that's improved the signal quite a bit. Now if I select all again, and then go up to effect, and this time choose the compressor, and I'll leave the presets as is and click OK. And so that's now compressed the signal quite a bit. So it's made the quiet bits louder and the loud bits quieter. Now what I'll do is I'll select the background noise again. And then go up to Effect and Noise Reduction and then Get Noise Profile. And then select the whole waveform. Go back to Effect, Noise Reduction and okay cool so let's go back to the start of the track and i'll just play that this is a little section to see how we can get rid of background noise right and this is the original this is a little section to see how we can get rid of background noise that's a big difference huh and we'll go back to what we just did this is a little section to see how we can get rid of background noise. So there you go, that's how powerful Audacity is and it's really, really simple to use. Now there are other audio workstations that you can use, but 
Audacity for simple work like lectures and meetings and simple notes is absolutely brilliant. Cool, so that's Audacity. Let's close out of there. And I won't save that. And those are our multimedia applications. So let's move on to the next category. So what we're going to install now will actually allow us to manage our finances. Now this is absolutely vital if you're running a business or if you're a student. So let's install those now. So if I open up the software manager and then do a search for GNU Cash. And there we go. So I'll just click on the first one and then install. Then continue and add in your password. And I'll fast forward this bit and rejoin you once the install has completed. Fantastic, that's installed. So I'll add that to my favorites. Right click add to favorites. And although GNU Cash is absolutely brilliant, there is another really amazing accounting application. So if you jump back online, so in the address bar, do a search for Scrooge, and that's spelt with a K, so S K R O O G E. There we go. So there's the link there, Scrooge.org. And so I've only just started using Scrooge, but it is absolutely brilliant. So if you click on the download button, And then scroll down and we can see here there is either the snap or the app image that I could recommend installing. The snap because it has been secured by App Armor, so it actually runs kind of sandboxed in our systems, which is a brilliant option. But I'm not going to install that right now. I'll just minimize Firefox and move on to the next category, which is encryption. So now that we've actually installed our accounting software, we want to be able to secure it. So the next application will allow us to secure not only our accounting software, but any file we have on our computer. So if we jump back online and then do a search for VeraCrypt. So this is the official website here, veracrypt.fr. And I'll just minimize the software manager. Cool, and then go over to downloads. And then scroll down till we find Linux. And so we're using Ubuntu 18.04. So that's us here. So we can click that. And then open with the GW package installer. Here we go, and I'll just click Install Package, and I'll expand the terminal. And there we go, the install has completed. So I'll close the GDB Package Installer, and I'll minimize Firefox. And so what I'll do is I'll firstly add it to my favorites. And so to demonstrate how it works, I'll create a file to encrypt. So I'll open up GNU Cache. I'll just close that. Right, and then I'll just go File, New File. And then I'll follow the wizard. And just go forward, forward, and apply. Cool, and I'll save it to my cloud drive. And I'll just save it in here. I'll give it a name. Cool, so I can close that now and then jump into the apps menu and open up VeraCrypt and then create a volume. So I'll just select one of these volumes here, click create volume and then I'll leave this with create an encrypted file container, just click next and then I'll just do the standard volume type. You can actually create a hidden volume type which is a really powerful function. Basically you can create a file that's encrypted and then within that, another file that's hidden but encrypted. And so if you were ever asked to decrypt your VeraCrypt file and someone wanted you to do it in front of them, 
then you can decrypt the first volume that has the files that you don't mind people seeing and there is actually another hidden volume which is actually invisible until you open that volume so essentially it's like double security and I'll just leave it on the standard volume type click next then I'll select a file and I'll actually create a folder and for this demonstration I'll just call this Vera and then give it a name now I wouldn't normally call it encrypted but for this demonstration I will so then click Save cool then click Next and Next now for this option you just have to make sure that the volume size that you choose will always be bigger than the file that you're encrypting so for example if I open up a file browser window and then go to my cloud drive and so this is the cache file that I'll be encrypting so I'll right click that and go to properties and as we can see it is only 3.4 kilobytes in size so if I close that and that's without data so I'll assume that this file will probably be only a few meg in size so if I create a volume which is say 11 megabytes in size and then click next and then choose a password cool and then click next now if I had have created a shorter password then it would have given me a warning that the password was too short so hence I created a longer password then click next and now if you just move your mouse around randomly this will actually give us the encryption that we will be encrypting the file with and you can keep moving your mouse around basically the longer you move it around the more encryption you create now that'll do for now so I'll just click format And there we go, the volume has been created. So I'll just click OK and then exit. Cool, so if I open up another file browser window, and then here is our folder. And if I open up that, this is the encrypted file. So now if I go back to VeraCrypt, and now I'll select the file. And then I'll click Mount. And then I'll enter the password that I created. And then my computer password. And there we go, that's unlocked that file. So now if I double click this, we are now inside of this file here. So what I'll do is I'll move that to the right. And then grab the cache file, move that into this volume here. Now I can delete this one here. Cool, and I'll just close that file browser window and then go back to VeraCrypt and I'll now dismount. And so now if we go back to the encrypted file, there is our encrypted file. So I've now moved the GNU cache file into this encrypted file and there's kind of no way you can really open it unless you use VeraCrypt. So now if I open up my GNU cache application, and it's showing that the original cache file can't be found, so I'll just close that. And so now if I wanted to actually edit my cache file, then I just go to VeraCrypt, and that's already selected. I'll click Mount, enter my password, There we go, that's decrypted. So I'll now double click that. And now if I go back to GNU Cache, and if I close the GNU Cache application, and I'll close without saving, now I can just double click this file to open up GNU Cache. And there we go, there's our file that we can now work on. And now that we've opened it, the next time I open GNU Cache, as long as I've decrypted the file, then I'll be able to work on it. So now that we've created that, and probably a good idea is actually to jump back into, say, Bitwarden or KeyPass XC and just save your password in one of those applications. 
Cool, so that's our encryption done. I'll close out of all of these. I'll close that and that, and I'll dismount and exit and close this file and this file browser and move on to the next category, which are our teleconferencing applications. Now, if you do business, you probably use Zoom or Skype a lot. So what we're gonna do is now install both of those. So let's install Skype first. I'll just jump online. And then in the address bar, do a search for Skype for Linux. There we go, so we have a few options. We can either install the Snap Pack or we can actually go to the Skype website and just click on the Get Skype. And there we go, we have the Skype for Linux deb package. So I'll click that. And then we'll get it to open with the GDB package installer. So just click OK. And so that's downloading. Enter your password. And then install package. Cool, so that's completed. We can now close the GDB package installer and I'll add that to my favorites. And I'll run that one time. And you'll notice down here in the system tray, the Skype icon will appear. So there it is there. And there we go, we can log in from here. So there we go, it's that simple. So I'll close out of there and I'll quit Skype from here. And let's now install Zoom. So I know that a lot of people use Zoom. So just do a search for Zoom for Linux. Here we go, and here's the download link for Linux. So I'll just click Download Center Zoom. And then for Linux type, just select Ubuntu. Choose your architecture, so I'm using 64-bit. And then we'll leave it on 16.04 plus, so that's anything above 16.04. Then click Download. And open with GDB package installer. Throw in your password. And then install package. So I'll expand the terminal. Brilliant, the installation has completed, so let's close the GDB package installer and I'll minimize Firefox and of course add Zoom to the favorites. There we go, and I'll just run that one time as well. And there we go, we can now use Zoom on our computer. Fantastic, so I'll close out of Zoom. And let's now install one more awesome teleconferencing application. So for this one, we'll open up Firefox. And then in the address line, do a search for Jitsi Meet. Cool, and let's open up this link here. Meet.jit.c. So to start a meeting, all you have to do is create a room name. So let's see, this is a room that I've made. And I'll click allow and enter my name. And I'll just open up the camera. And there we go. So all I have to do is invite anyone to this particular room that I just made, which is called, this is a room that I've made. <laughs> uh, but don't worry, I'm actually going to delete this. So that's how easy it is to create a room to teleconference in. So I'll actually leave this room in here. And if I go back 
to the Jitsi Meet start page and then actually create an SSB for this. So let's open up the ICE manager and I'll just move that to the right and I'll just name the application. So it's Jitsi Meet and then I'll copy and paste the URL. And then I'll place it in the internet category. I'll use the site Favicon. Nope, that's not loading. So what I'll do is I'll just open a new tab, do a search for Jitsi, and then go to the Wikipedia page. And I'll right click this little Jitsi logo and open image in new tab. There it is there, I'll right click that, save image as, and then I'll go to other locations, computer, user, share, scroll down to icons, and then open up my stem icons folder, and then I'll actually get rid of SVG, and click save. And then in the ICE application, click select an icon, go back one folder, scroll up to icons, open up my stem icons folder, and logo Jitsi is selected, click open, and then apply, and now close, and I'll close this tab and this tab, and minimize Firefox, and then add Jitsi Meet to my favorites. There it is there, right click that, add to favorites. And now we have Jitsi Meet installed. So although this is an online application, it's now behaving like a native application. So that is the power of SSB. It's an absolutely brilliant feature of Peppermint. Call in if you wanted to improve Jitsi, you just have to press Alt on your keyboard and then go to Edit and Settings and you can restore previous session if you have a room that you want to use all the time. And I'll always ask where to save files, play DRM controlled content, change the search to DuckDuckGo, Privacy and Security. Can give it a primary password and I'll also deselect the data collection and control W to close that window and now we can actually use Jitsi Meet as an SSB so that's done now let's close out of there Brilliant, so we're actually in the home stretch now. We've only got a few more applications to install. And the final category of applications will actually be our utilities. So firstly, let's jump into the Synaptic Package Manager. Now the next application we're going to install is an application called Redshift. Now on a Windows machine, you probably use Flux, or on a Mac, you probably use Night Shift that's built in. So what Redshift does is that it actually at night time will block blue light in your screen. So basically if you have too much blue light in your screen and you're working late into the night, then you're actually kind of tricking your brain into thinking that it's still daylight. So if you try to go to sleep straight after you've been working, then you may find it difficult. But by blocking the blue light spectrum in your screen, then it means that you can actually work late and then as soon as you turn your screen off, you can still go to sleep pretty much straight away. So Let's do a search for Redshift. There we go. And we want this Redshift-GTK. So if you just right click that and mark for installation and then click mark and that will select Redshift as well. Then click apply and apply. And I'll just expand the details here. And cool, that's installed. So let's jump into the apps menu and do a search for Redshift. There it is there. So I'll just start that up. 
and down here in the system tray this is the redshift launcher so if you right click that you can see that it is enabled auto start is also enabled and so we don't actually have to do anything with that now basically the next time we reboot our computer then Redshift will automatically start. Now, if you're actually working on things like graphic design at night time and you really need precision in your color picking, then you can suspend this for a couple of hours or just deselect enabled. So for the remainder of this video, I'm actually going to disable this just so that we have a normal screen. Cool, so that's done. Let's minimize the Synaptic Package Manager and then jump back into the Apps menu and this time do a search for Torrent you'll see that there is a BitTorrent client already installed. So I'm actually gonna replace this with Kubertorrent because I actually prefer Kubertorrent to the pre-installed torrent clients. So firstly, we're going to uninstall this one and then install Kubertorrent. So if you right click BitTorrent client and then head down to edit application, and this shows us that the BitTorrent client is transmission GTK. So with that in mind, I'll just cancel out of here jump back into the Synaptic Package Manager, and then do a search for transmission. There we go, so I'll just scroll down here and I'll select the transmission GTK, right click, mark for complete removal, and then I'll also select transmission common, and I'll right click that, mark for complete removal, and that's all of them, so let's click apply, and apply, And I'll expand the details. And we are done. So let's now install Kubertorrent. So I'll just go back into the filter and then type in Kubertorrent. There it is there. So I'll just select the first one, mark for installation, and then apply. Click apply again. And I'll expand the details, and this should actually be pretty quick. There we go, that's done. So I'll minimize the Synaptic Package Manager, and I'll add Kubertorrent to our favorites. So let's just head back in here. There it is there, and I'll just right-click that, add to favorites. Oh, right-click that, add to favorites. And there it is there. So we are done for that. I'll delete it from the desktop. Cool, so the next install we're going to do is for an application called Stacer. Now Stacer is absolutely brilliant. It's very, very easy to use and actually allows us to not only clean our system, but also tweak it. So let's install it. So to do that, just jump into Firefox. and then do a search for Stacer. And here it is here from Ogu Zaninan's GitHub, Stacer, the Linux system optimizer and monitoring. Let's click that. And so we're gonna copy and paste these commands into our terminal. So let's tile this window to the left. There we go, and open a terminal window, Control-Alt-T. There we go. And I'll tile this to the right. And then grab the first line by triple clicking. Right click copy. And then in terminal paste. Add in your password. And then enter. Fantastic, let's get the next line. So just triple click the next line, which starts with sudo and then right click copy, right click paste. And then the final line, so just triple click to get the whole line and then right click copy, right click paste and enter. Oops, we've run into an error and it says resource temporarily unavailable unable to acquire the dpackage front end lock and is another process using it and of course there is because we have synaptic package manager still open so i'll close out of the synaptic package manager 
and then I'll paste the command again and enter and now the install is good. Fantastic, that's Stacer installed. So I'll close out of the terminal and I'll minimize Firefox and I'll actually add Stacer to my favorites as well. There it is there, so I'll just right click, add to favorites. There we go, now we only have one more application left to install. So this is an application that I've only just discovered recently and it will actually optimize the laptop battery. Now if you're running a desktop then you probably won't have to worry about this, but I found this to be quite a good little program. So I'll jump back into Firefox and then in the address line do a search for TLP Linux. There we go, and then just click on the first one, which is the linrunner.de forward slash TLP. And then click on installation. And then select Ubuntu. And these are the commands that we're going to enter into our terminal. So control alt T to open terminal window tile that to the right and then triple click to get the first line right click copy right click paste into your password try that again and then enter again cool and let's grab the second line so just triple click Right click copy, right click paste. Cool, and then scroll down the page slightly. And let's install it by running this command here. So triple click, right click copy, and then paste. Y for yes. And we are done. Cool, so let's jump back into the terminal and let's run TLP. Okay, I see here TLP start. So I'll just copy that and then paste that into the command line. Oh, could actually add sudo. And there we go, TLP has started. So that's all there is to it. We don't actually have to deep dive into how to run TLP because it's actually a very good program. It actually runs automatically very effectively. Of course, we are done. So let's now exit out of the terminal and close a Firefox. And that is it, we are done. So let's do a reboot and I'll see you on the other side of the reboot. Of course we've done our reboot and as you've noticed the Skype application automatically opens so I actually don't want that to happen every time I reboot so I'm actually going to disable the auto start for that. So to do that jump into your apps menu and then type in default and default applications for Alex session that's what we're going to open now and then jump into auto start and I'll maximize this Alex session configuration window and then just scroll down the page until you find Skype for Linux, there it is there, and then just deselect that. So this is the list that you can enable or disable anything that you want to auto start. So that's done. I'll close out of there now and I'll right click Skype to quit it. And I'll also disable Redshift just for the remainder of this video. There we go, there's only a few more things to do, so let's just check the updates. So I'll just refresh that to see if there's anything available. Nope, that's all good, so I can close out of the update manager. And let's also update using our terminal, so Control alt t to open a terminal window, and I'll maximize this window, and then run the command sudo apt update.
add in your password. Cool, and then run the command sudo apt upgrade. Cool, and then let's run the final command, which you can see here, sudo apt auto remove. That's what we're actually going to run now. So sudo apt auto remove. And then y for yes. And I'll fast forward this and then rejoin you once this has completed. Brilliant, that's completed, so let's exit out of terminal. So just type in exit. And let's now use Stata to clean up our system. So jump into your apps menu, and then open up Stata. And there we go, we're in Stata. So Stata is an absolutely brilliant application. So I'll jump into the settings first, and I'll get the start page to open on the system cleaner. And that way, every time you open it, it will automatically open to the system cleaner and this is the system cleaner here and to run the system cleaner all you have to do is either select any item that you want to clean i actually noticed the trash can isn't on my desktop i'll add that back to my desktop so just right click your desktop customize desktop settings and then enable trash and also mounted drive so if there's any mounted drives attached to my system it'll show up on the desktop so I'll close out of the desktop settings and I'll actually select all. So I'll just click the tick button down here and then see what's available to clean. And there's what, probably almost two gigabytes worth of cleaning that we can do. So click on select all here and then click this blue cleaning button. Add in your password. And we are done. So that was pretty quick, wasn't it? So that's 1.8 gigabytes worth of files that have been cleaned off the system. And as you can see, the trash can is no longer bloated. Of course, if you'd like me to create a video on how to run Stacer, then let me know in the comments. But there are plenty of awesome videos already on YouTube about how to run Stacer. So I'll actually close out of Stacer. And I'll actually quit completely. And we are almost done. So the very last thing to do now is actually take a snapshot of our system settings. And that way, everything that we've done till now, we'll actually have a snapshot saved for it. And if you wanted to actually save the snapshot to an external hard drive, that would be even better. And that way, if you did run into issues down the track, or if you wanted to start from scratch or back from this point here, then you can easily revert to the time shift snapshot. So let's open time shift, open up your apps menu and then click on time shift, throw in your password. And as you can see, there is already an auto saved snapshot that's been taken. And this was actually taken today when I started today's session. So let's create a snapshot now, just click create. And so this will take a few minutes. So I'll fast forward this and rejoin you once this process has completed. And there we go, that's completed. So let's now name it by double clicking in the comments. And I'll just call this apps installed. There we go. And if you wanted to know what these tags mean, if you just hover over the tag, it shows that O means on demand. And that means we manually created this snapshot. D means daily. So that's the daily snapshot. So we can actually delete this snapshot here so i'll just select that and click delete and so this will take a few minutes so i'll fast forward this and rejoin you once this process has completed and that's it we're done so let's close time shift and we are done for this session so Thanks for joining me on this little mission and I hope that your Peppermint 10 system now runs absolutely beautifully. So if this has been of any help to you, please leave us a like or consider subscribing and I'll see you in the next episode where we'll actually jump into another operating system. And this is another favorite of mine. We'll be jumping into Manjaro. So I'll see you in the next episode.